This is my home lab. And if I had a nickel for every time someone asked me, why do you need all this? I'd probably have a few nickels, but today I'm gonna answer that question and say, I don't need all of that. In fact, I'm gonna replace all of that with this guy. Well, most everything. Cool transition. Did it work? So the idea for this video wasn't to build out the most powerful system and say, look, I replaced my system with a $10,000 PC. That's dumb. And maybe something I'll eventually do. The idea here was to use older, but a still capable desktop and upgrade it to give it a fighting chance. Just so happens that I have this PC from my $100 home server video, and that gave me the perfect starting point. The other toppings we have here, we'll get to in a bit. Now, before I talk about what I added to this thing, let me very briefly go over what's in my home lab. I have two whole ass videos going over this, but for the most part, I have a main Epic system running Proxmox and virtualizing TrueNAS. Then I have a three node HA Proxmox cluster that runs Kubernetes and Docker, a Synology backup system and a unified network setup. The specs on this $100 home server were a four core i5-6500, eight gigabytes of RAM and dual three terabyte hard drives with a 60 gigabyte SSD for a boot drive. Yeah, nothing to write home about. The first thing I wanted to do was to upgrade the processor to at least give us some hyper threading. I went with an i7-6700 off eBay for $65. This gives us four cores and eight threads and boost up to 3.6 gigahertz with a TDP of 65 watts. Again, nothing to brag to your girlfriend about, but certainly better than the 6500. For RAM, we upgraded from eight gigabytes to 64. I already had these laying around, but if you were to buy brand new RAM, you're looking at roughly $120. For storage, I went with two four terabyte drives. Again, something I had laying around, but if you wanna go with new, you can get two of them for about $160, or if you go refurbished, you can get it for about a hundred. Obviously your storage needs will determine how much you spend here, but this is my build. So yeah, at this point we've upgraded our system with $340 worth of parts, which is on top of the hundred dollars we already spent initially, but we aren't done yet. The board in here has four PCI gen three slots. Three of them are one X slots and one of them is a full 16 X slot. This is plenty for what we want to do in here. And this is where you can get really creative in how you customize something like this to fit your needs. And wait, what's this? This video is sponsored by Ugreen and their Nexo charging solutions. Their Nexo line of chargers utilize gallium nitride technology, which isn't just for sounding cool. It allows them to be smaller, lighter, and more efficient. Ugreen has just released their Nexode Pro line as well, based on the same GAN tech, but now improved in all aspects with their new GA Infinity chip. I personally use their 100 watt model, but it also comes in a 65 watt model if you don't need that much juice, or a 160 watt model if you're super thirsty. With three ports, two USB-C, and a single USB-A, it's just enough for me. And the C1 port can even provide 100 watts max charging power. I can supply a full 65 watts to my MacBook Pro, and the other two ports can do 15 watts for my iPhone and Apple Watch, or camera, or Nintendo Switch. Of course, there are no shortage of other charging solutions from Ugreen, so go ahead and check them out using the links down below. So there are two things I knew I needed to add. NVM expansion, so we could have fast storage for our VMs and to run our host on, and high-speed networking, because one gigabit in 2024 just ain't gonna cut it. Fortunately, there are 1X PCIe cards that fix both of these. For $10, I snagged a PCIe card that houses a single NVMe drive, and then for $45, I got a dual 2.5 gigabit NIC. I threw a two terabyte NVMe drive on there, which houses my Proxmox install, as well as all of my VMs. A two terabyte NVMe drive will run you about $100 brand new, so let's just add that to the tab. After this, I'm left with another 1X slot and our 16X slot. I debated for a while what to do with these, and initially ordered a Connect X3 to give this thing 40 gigabit networking instead of 2.5, but I was having trouble with the card and, in the end, I decided that if we want this thing to do everything, why not have a gaming VM? 
we are pretty limited in terms of what GPU we could have gone since in here, we need something that's not only low profile, but also single slot since we will be using all four of these slots. That basically had us choosing between an NVIDIA GT 1030 or an AMD RX 6400, neither of which are really that good. The 1030 has two gigabytes of VRAM and was released in 2017, but can be had for only $70. The RX 6400 is much newer as it was released in 2022, has double the VRAM at 4GB, and is much more powerful, but it costs $160. Honestly, if you're just playing indie games or some eSport titles at lower quality, then the 1030 isn't too bad. I eventually went with the RX 6400, and it's really not a great card, but more on that later. To fill our last 1x slot, I knew I needed a multi-port NIC, and that is because we're going to virtualize our firewall on here. I'm running PFSense as my firewall, which will require the VM to have at least two ports for the WAN and the LAN connections. I know I already have a dual 2.5 gigabit card, but that's dedicated for our TrueNAS VM, so we can have fast access to our storage. I snagged a dual gigabit NIC for $27. You can probably find them cheaper, but PFSense doesn't play too well with certain chips, but I know that it likes Intel ones, so we splurged a little bit. And that's it for the hardware. If you're keeping score at home, we've put in nearly $700 worth of hardware into this thing. That added up quick. Now, am I going to sit here and say that you need to spend $700 to turn your PC into a competent home server? Absolutely not. I don't have a chair. I just wanted to see what it would take for me to turn this $100 PC into something I could possibly replace my entire home lab with. So let's move on to the software side of things. I mentioned that I'd be running Proxmox and I wasn't lying. And within Proxmox, the first thing I set up was my true NAS VM because you know what they say, a server without a NAS OS is like a car without a NAS OS. And this is what I'm doing with my main server and it works great. And to make sure I'm getting the most out of my drives, I'm passing through the entire SATA controller to TrueNAS. So it has direct communication with my drives. And honestly, it's just easier. From there, I created a simple ZFS mirror with my two four terabyte drives and set up some SMB shares. I also have that 60 gigabyte SSD in here that I guess I could use as some kind of cache, but yeah. I gave the VM 32 gigabytes of RAM, so that's plenty. As for the high-speed networking we talked about, I have the dual 2.5 gigabit NIC passed through as well, so this setup can be plugged into any 2.5 gigabit compatible switch or network, and we're good. I tested the throughput on our mirrored pool, and we were able to saturate the 2.5 gig connection, so maybe I should have used that 40 gigabit card. Next up, we have our Docker instance. I'm just running a plain old Ubuntu server VM with a simple Docker install and portainer on top of that. This is no different than any Docker instance I'm running in my entire home lab. Until someone comes along with a better Docker management UI than portainer, that's what I'm gonna use. From here, it's as easy as just copying over my compose templates and spinning up all my services. I have an R stack for sharing and managing Linux ISOs, an own cache streaming server, Pi-hole, Nginx proxy manager, a static site with little link, few WordPress sites, Othelia, all kinds of stuff. But none of this is really that resource intensive for your CPU and most likely be more bottlenecked by the amount of RAM you have and how fast your storage is. Obviously you can run more on here, but this is a good litmus test of what you can expect on hardware like this. Moving on to something that requires a bit more horsepower, Plex. One huge benefit with the 6700 in here is that it has an integrated GPU that we can use for hardware transcoding. While it is a bit dated, we still get access to 8-bit H.265 transcoding, so not bad. If you don't know what any of that means, just know that it's perfectly fine for 99% of content that isn't HDR or 10-bit. I spun up my Plex instance a little differently in Proxmox. You see, I could have gone with a VM and passed through the integrated graphics for a Plex to use, but I've had some issues with this in the past and decided to go a different route. I'm running an LXC container, which runs directly on the host kernel and has direct access to the host hardware, including the integrated GPU. 
I did have to add some lines to the LXC config file in Proxmox for the container to properly utilize the GPU, but after that, we were good to go. I'm just running an Ubuntu server template with a direct Plex install via the app repository. I did also run this LXC as privilege so that I could easily mount my TrueNAS shares. All of my legally obtained movies that I ripped from my DVDs that I kept receipts for are stored on my TrueNAS instance and accessed via SMB by Plex. When I go to test some playback, you can see that when I change the playback to something other than native, Plex will start live transcoding and we can see it's being performed by our QuickSync enabled integrated GPU. This is cool because it saves the CPU from being throttled anytime Plex needs to transcode something. This may not be a huge deal if you have like a 96 core processor, but we don't. And QuickSync hardware built into this chip is better being utilized than not, so neat. I was able to have this thing transcoding two streams of 1080p content at the same time without making the CPU poop its pants. If you were to try that without the integrated GPU, you'd have a bad time. Now, not only are we going to rely on this machine to feed us some delicious sitcoms and movies, it's also gonna be serving up games for us. That's right. We're using this as a game server to host a few private game servers like Minecraft and CS2. I'll be honest with you guys, I'm not much of a gamer anymore, but I know a lot of you out there are and want to host your own game servers. The popular way to host a game server these days is to spin up a pterodactyl instance, but I find it overly complicated and a pain in the Johnson. After browsing around, I came across an alternative called AMP. Now it's not free and will require a one-time payment of $10 to get up and going, but this was honestly worth it. The setup process was so much easier and I was hosting a Minecraft server in like five minutes. I spun up both the Java and Bedrock editions of Minecraft as well as a CS2 server. With players in both games, everything runs well and while you can tell that something's going on when checking the CPU usage, it's not crying out for help. Now, if you're hosting more games with larger player bases while also spinning up 50 Docker containers, transferring data and transcoding five simultaneous streams from Plex, then yeah, I'd get the fire extinguisher ready. But at some point you have to temper your expectations a bit when working with older consumer level hardware. But we aren't done yet. I said we're using this thing for a firewall. I installed PFSense on here in its own VM and passed through our dual one gigabit NIC. Setup was pretty easy. Just select which interface you wanna use for WAN, which one to use for LAN, and boom, you're done. The chip in here also has AES-NI support, so you get much better performance when using a VPN server or client. Now, I'll be straight with you guys. I wouldn't normally do this. I'm not a big virtual firewall guy, as I like to have a dedicated unit. Yes, I know the pros and cons, but ultimately, that's just what I like. However, I know a lot of you like doing this, which is why I wanted to show it off. And since our firewall is now virtualized within Proxmox, we kind of have a weird network setup. Our WAN feeds into the PF Sense port that we assigned as our WAN, and our LAN port runs to a switch so that we can use it for more than one device. From there, we can run it to all of our devices like access points, servers, and well, our Proxmox server. So wait, our Proxmox host network relies on a VM running within Proxmox host itself? Yep, and I mean, it works. It just makes me a little uneasy since if there's an issue with Proxmox itself, the entire network is messed up. Sure, you can restore from a backup on another device and yes, even dedicated firewalls die, but I don't know. I just sleep better at night knowing that my firewall is on its own device. In terms of performance, it's fine. This is plenty enough power for a firewall and Unless you're doing heavy inner VLAN communications, you won't even know that you're running on an eight-year-old virtualized hardware. I bought that RX 6400 and passed it through to a Windows VM, along with a mouse and keyboard to essentially act as my own little gaming desktop. I can understand those of you out there saying, Brett, I don't need my server to be a gaming system. I know that, but whose build is this? Oh yeah, it's mine. So performance on here for gaming is Okay, the 6700 gives us enough juice for 1080p gaming and 
the RX 6400 is modern enough to keep up at 1080p, even on AAA titles. Sure, you'll have to turn the graphics settings down on some games, but it should be able to handle pretty much anything you throw at it. The big drawback of this card though is that it has no hardware encoding built in. This means that for streaming and transcoding, it's worthless. You may not care if you're not a streamer, but another thing that is affected by this is cloud gaming. If you wanted to set up this VM as a cloud gaming server where you could just remote in with Parsec to play all your games, not happening. However, with all of that said, as a standalone gaming PC, it's pretty solid. I did mention that in my home lab, I have a Kubernetes cluster running on a three node Proxmox cluster. And while it's not physically possible to run an HA Proxmox system on a single machine, it is possible to set up a Kubernetes cluster just to play with. I just spun up three Ubuntu server VMs, installed K3S on each of them as a server and a client. And just like that, I had a three node cluster to test with. Obviously, you shouldn't do this in a production environment that requires high availability, but this is plenty enough to test with. Another thing that goes on the physically impossible list is a backup. I mean, you could run a second TrueNAS instance on here with a separate set of drives and backup to that, but if it's on the same exact host, I wouldn't really consider that even to be a backup. So overall, were we able to run everything in my home lab? No. Like I mentioned, some things I'm running are impossible to do on a single system. Do I still think this is a capable device? Um, duh. I pretty much ran a lot of the services most people use along with a gaming VM and a virtualized firewall with no issues. Also, this thing only pulls down like 55 watts, which isn't bad for older hardware with a bunch of fixings. That doesn't mean I'm recommending you go out and spend like $800 and build this exact same system. Odds are that $800 could be better spent on hardware that is better suited for your exact needs. But you gotta admit, this was pretty cool. If you think so, then go ahead and drop a like. If you like content like this, then go ahead and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments what you would have done with the $100 server or how I could have better used these $700 as an upgrade. I wanna give a huge shout out to my YouTube members and my Patreons. You guys are my low profile single slot GPU, but like you guys actually have hardware encoding, so you're kind of useful. You guys are great. And if you're still watching, you're like a seven out of 10. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one.